Okay, we're rolling. Okay, this is an interview with James Patrick Murphy, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 26th of August, 2003, approximately 2.30 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? James P. Murphy. The, uh, the date of birth is 1918, July 13th, 1918, in Rochester, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? Uh, a parochial school in, the, in the public high school. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and what your reaction was when you were heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, at the time, there was little discussion before that, and I was truly, I was indifferent to it. Do you remember where you were when you heard about it? No, I think it was a Sunday morning. I think mm -hmm. I was in bed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you, were you drafted or did you enlist? I, I, dra I was drafted, but I qualified for the Air Corps before I was finally drafted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where did you go for your induction? I went to Fort Niagara, New York, on Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. Did you do any basic training there, or were you just uh, was that the induction that, center? That was the thing. In view of the fact that I qualified for Air Cadets, they held me up for an Air Corps replacement center. All the other members that went in there with me. They were sent out the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I was sent down to Gulfport, Mississippi, which was an Air Force induction center down there. Okay. Uh, what kind of training did you receive? Well, uh, it was just the uh, basic training, and while I was taking the basic training, because I had qualified for Air Cadets, they sent me to Philadelphia to go to Air Mechanic School. And I spent, a, I don't know how long, was it, uh, six months or eight months in Philadelphia uh, going to mechanic school. Mm -hmm. And ironically enough, this is the war against Japan, and the name of the mechanic school I attended was the Rising Sun School of Aeronautics. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for it was because it was a, located on Rising Sun Boulevard in Philadelphia. Ah, okay. All right, where did you go after you spent time in Philadelphia? Uh, after I spent time in Philadelphia, because now I had air mechanics behind me, they sent me to Lynn, Massachusetts, to su Turbo Supercharger School. And I spent about a month or six weeks over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after that? They, they sent me to New Jersey, or uh, Dayton, Ohio. And I spent, I spent, oh, about a month or so there, and they, they finally assigned me to uh, an airfield in Columbus, Ohio. And in the, in the course of this, every time they changed, went to change me, I said I was qualified as an air cadet. And they sent me someplace else. And then I was home on furlough. I hadn't been on a furlough in all this time. And I was home on furlough, and I got the call for cadets. Mm -hmm. And they sent me out to Santa Ana, California. And what kind of what training did you do out there? Yeah, well, they, the basic air cadet training. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they sent me to primary flight school from there, to Tulare, California. And uh, ironically, I washed out in primary. And the reason I washed out was that the the instructor had taken me up to about 8,000 feet in this two-seated bi-wing plane. And we got up there, and uh, he, he said to me, now this is what happens when you try to gain altitude too rapidly. And he, so we started to go up, and what he did was stall out. And when he stalled out, the plane started to twirl in one direction. And he said, when you try to overcompensate, this is what happened. He pulled the lever the other way. Now, this is off from 8,000 feet. We're getting to ground very mm -hmm. rapidly. And finally, about 
4,000 feet. He finally pulls it out and uh, he takes it back up to altitude again. And then he said to me, he said, take me home. And I said to him, where is home? And he took me home and he said, that's as far as you're going. Mm -hmm. Because I lost my bearings. And at the time, too, I think it wasn't all me. We're going back when planes were not as plentiful as men. The B-29 was, wasn't even in the air yet, mm -hmm. or may have been very experimental. Mm -hmm. The B-17 was doing them. And in fact, when I first went to England, we didn't have a fighter escort. That's how much of the war we were at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after you left the cadet program, where did you go? Uh, then, uh, i got to stop and think for a minute. Uh, I completed my, uh, I, I was, they, they sent me to, uh, where was it? I think that then they sent me back to Ohio. Yes, they sent me back to Ohio, and uh, I was uh, kept there for a while until uh, they uh, they signed me to a crew. And uh, the, the first formality was the crew was shaking hands. That 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 took care of the first phase of it, mm -hmm. and then we flew around together and uh, out in Oregon and uh, made made some flights out there just to get familiarized and we didn't spend any time really training and uh, then finally we went overseas. Mm -hmm. we went now over what did you train on B-17s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you ended up uh, a turret gunner, did you ever go to a gunnery school? Oh, that's one phase I did leave out. Mm -hmm. After after the uh, uh, training in the turbo supercharger schools they they sent me to gun to gunnery school. I have a little vague here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the course of the training, I spent some time in Salt Lake City, and that was after I came out of Las Vegas, Nevada, at gunnery school. I went to they said they sent me to Las Vegas, Nevada, for gunnery school. And uh, when I graduated from gunnery school, he sent me to Salt Lake City, and that's where I met my crew. Okay. Um, did you stay with this crew for the most of the war, or all the rest of the yes, war? Yes, yes, but uh, we weren't a group from day one until the end. We flew into, uh, with other crews mm -hmm. so that the, if anything happened, the crew wouldn't all be startled and, and make mistakes and go down. There'd mm -hmm. be all these other uh, crew members that were more familiar with what was going on. Mm -hmm. So therefore, all the crew members didn't finish up the same time because sometimes the their raid would their crew would be called off or something like that. Mm -hmm. So all the crew members, each one had a. Now, did you, how did you uh, go over to England? Did you fly over? Or yes, the, uh, we flew out of. Uh, uh, what was it? Bangor, Maine. Mm -hmm. Did you take a brand new aircraft over? It was. I don't know whether it was a brand new aircraft or not. I never. I never stopped to think of it. I would believe that it was fairly a new aircraft mm -hmm. because uh, the pilot and the co-pilot were complete strangers to us, and there was two or three men, maybe four men, flying with it, and uh, it's so vague in my mind. And we stopped at Newfoundland on the way over, and then we flew from there to Scotland. Mm -hmm. Once you got over there, you changed planes. You didn't keep that it, Yeah, we changed planes, and then we went south, and then we got into uh, crews over there. Did you uh, pretty much use the same plane? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of my uh, tour? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you name the plane at all? No, the name the, the name was on the plane. What was the name? Uh, it is Delight. <laughs> did you have that painted on your jacket too? No. no. Did you ever have a decorated jacket? Yes, but I uh, gave it away way too soon, uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they, the, what they did was each time they complete a raid, they'd get somebody to paint another bomb on mm -hmm. their jacket. Mm -hmm. Did you and have anything else painted on it, just the bombs? or I, I just had the bombs mm -hmm. on mine. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the name in the back, Idiot's Delight. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, when was your first mission? Well, what, what was your assignment? What unit were you assigned to? I was assigned to ball turn. Well, what unit in, in you were assigned 8th Air Force? Air, uh, 440 sec, 442nd Group. Okay. Um, when was your first mission? Actually, yeah, you've got my paper there. It's, it says, uh, I don't know what it says the mission, but uh, it was in, in November of that year. It's on, it's on there. Oh yes, November 43, yes. All right. Now you said that uh, that was your first mission and you didn't think you'd survive. Why? Where, where did you go on your first mission? Do you well, recall? Any, any, any mission, you, you wouldn't think it, it. You have to sit in the ball turret to, to see what I saw. Mm -hmm. That was the whole thing. I saw more than anybody else in mm -hmm. the crew. Mm -hmm. and pilot, co-pilot, anybody. You've got 360 degrees around, you go 180 up and down, the bomb bay is up here, you see the bombs drop, you see them fall, you see them hit, and you also see any enemy fighters, you see all the flak, you see the whole smear all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're just wondering when the next one's going to hit you. Did you, were you ever, to, were you able to wear a flak jacket in there at all? Uh, no, not a, I, I wouldn't say a flak jacket, no. What did... Did you wear any protection? Yeah, no, it was, a, it was a heated suit. Mm -hmm. And you uh, you couldn't wear your chute in there? What? You never wore your parachute, did you? you no, no, the parachute was always outside. Okay. Mm -hmm. You had a harness on all the time. Mm -hmm. Could you get out of the turret by yourself, or did you have to have yeah. someone crank no, you out? No, I could get out by myself. Mm -hmm. How uh, could you get out by yourself? Yes. How could you do that? Well, you, you turn the guns down, and I would put the, put the uh, door up, and you just turn the doors and go into the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where were, where did you fly most of your missions to? Do you recall? Well, if I recall correctly, uh, geez, I, someplace I have some papers that have, have them all down. I haven't got the... Uh, there were a lot of uh, raids on France. We went deep into France, almost almost to Switzerland. We almost went to, uh, we went around close to Ger uh, Russia. And uh, I'll never forget one raid that was never mentioned. I, and I sometimes wonder if it's all in my imagination. We're on this raid, and this raid was, but we were supposed to be going to Berlin. And they had every B-17 that was available in England on that raid. As far as you could see, there was B-17s in all directions. And they were going on to raid Berlin. And they, because it was Berlin, and because it was the first target, they wanted to make a direct hit. And the radio operator, oh, maybe two or three hours into mission, of course, that you've got to remember, we circled around England and everything else before we started out. Uh, he got a recall command. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of B-17s. They got a recall. And the other thing feature you got to remember is that these pilots, some of them were 19, 20, 21 years old, and they had nine men under them, plus flying this B-17. And they got this recall, and the, and the radio operator told the pilot. And so the lead planes they were flying all in groups mm -hmm. and up and down. Well, the groups going, the first ones going, got the recall. And instead of turning around in formation and coming back in formation, they started to peel off and started to just turn around and come back. Well, the other planes were still coming. Mm -hmm. And I must have saw 10 or 11 mid-air collisions oh, of okay. American airplanes that day. And I have never read that any place in my life. And I, I, I said so many times, uh, I, I sometimes think it's all a figure, figure of my imagination because I never heard another thing about that.
and I can st still see it because the thing, the thought that was running through my mind, I'm down there and we're still going forward. Yeah. When's the next one going to hit us? Do you know if you don't know the exact date when that? No, happened? I don't. It was it was real early because before the first raid on Berlin, I think the next the Berlin the first raid on Berlin was probably made within the two or three weeks after that. Mm -hmm. Did you have any close calls where your plane was struck? Uh, our plane was struck once. Uh, the pilot got a, a, a wound. In fact, he was so proud of that wound, he demanded they give him a piece of shrapnel. He got a Purple Heart. But he was the only one that was wounded on our plane. Mm -hmm. It was just it was just lucky, that's all. Mm -hmm. How many missions did you fly? Twenty-nine. It says it, it says on thirty, but it was actually twenty-nine. Mm -hmm. Because see, the reason why it was twenty-nine was that when we first went over, it was twenty-five, and as D-Day became imminent, they were making shorter penetrations, and uh, they so they upped the number of missions. Well, maybe I had seventeen, eighteen in at the time. Well, if they would have pushed the, my missions up to 30, the morale would have went through the floor. So they, they dropped the number of missions to according to the number of raids you had in. I don't know what some of the other ones did, but I know that when I came down for my last raid, this one guy said, well, you only got one more to do. I said, not me. So you can get somebody else to do it. And they, they found that they'd made a mistake someplace along the line. Um, is there any other mission that stands out more than, except this one where you said the planes doubled back? There's another one that I had nothing to do with at all. I, that lucky bastard mm -hmm. fits me so aptly. I was in London on pass, and we got pass, maybe, maybe I got five or six passes and all the time was over, maybe a little more. But we're in London in their... The 8th Air Force made this raid, I believe it was on Stuttgart, Stuttgart, and it was a heavily defended city. And the, if, I, if I've got my information straight, it was the, the, not, uh, the 8th Air Force lost more planes that day than they did throughout the entire war of the air. And where was I? In London on pass. Mm -hmm. Now, what is this? Uh, if you want to hold this up, what, what, how did you get the Lucky Bastard Club? What does that mean? Well, no, after your last raid, they gave it to you. Mm -hmm. and Why do you hold it up to the camera? And, and this man who signs the, the first signature on here mm -hmm. is Fred, Frederick W. Castle. He's a former. Uh, executive uh, for one of the uh, uh, big, uh, what was it, air uh, company over here. Well, anyways, he, he became the, the commanding officer, and he was a colonel. And in the invasion, uh, he was flying low-level uh, low level B-17, and his entire crew got out of the plane, and he went down with the ship. Hmm. He stayed with the ship. He was a true hero. In fact, after I got back, that item was in the in the Time magazine. Okay, I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, when did you leave? Uh, when was your 29th mission, and when were you? When did you go back to the states? Well, shortly after that, whatever it says mm -hmm. there, November. It says on my. Oh yes. Okay, November of 45. Um, what did you do? Were you discharged right away, or no, no? I I was in for quite some time. I went. Uh, they said to me when I completed my tour, they said you have three options. One, you can train new gunners coming in, or two, you can volunteer for another tour, <laughs> and and three, you can trained for B-29s. Well, the B-29s were absolute new ship at this time. And I knew 
the only place for the B-29s were, were back in the States. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll volunteer for B-29s. And I got back to the States that way. Mm -hmm. Did you fly in B-29s? Yes, I flew in B-29s when I got back in the States. For a while, I uh, was so shook up by everything that I didn't even want to get near an airplane. Uh, but being a veteran uh, at that time, uh, they didn't have much of a job for me as a staff sergeant. And uh, with my qualifications, that they have a job for me. So they had me loading gasoline trucks at night to, to refuel the B-29s. And I wasn't too happy with that job at all. So I had a, I was in the barracks. And I had this friend in the barracks. In fact, I was his best man. He got married out in Pratt, Kansas. And uh, he asked me, he said, would you like to fly again? I said, sure. I said, anything to get out of this mm -hmm. job. And uh, so I went to fly with him. And they were test crew for B-29s. And what this meant, that in, uh, when a B-29 was finished and ready for flight, uh, the uh, new crew took took them up, or well, I shouldn't say that. They had an experienced crew take them up, and then bring them down. Then they turned them over to various crews to train them. Well, these these planes this time would fly all over the states, but they could only land at few airports because at that time the B-29 required so much landing space, and coincidentally. It was always the big near big city, and they would take off on them and they'd fly someplace, and they'd have a problems. So they would land the plane, they'd call up the the base. The base would send uh, a B-17, would pick up the crew members, drop off mechanics, and fly the crew members back to the base. And then, a week or ten days after the plane was fixed. This crew that I was with would go out and test top it, and uh, we'd take it up and fly it around, and that that was a wonderful experience because uh, these these guys that were first of all, I've, I've always said this that they always landed near a good city. Uh, the place we lived with Pratt, Kansas, was a one horse town. There was nothing. It was a dry state on top of everything else. So. We'd go and pick it up, and we'd pay to spend maybe two, two or three days there, because uh, we uh, check it all over ourselves, fly it, and then come back and check it again, and maybe make two or three flights before we flew it back to the base. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one weird experience I'll always remember was we went to uh, uh, Salt Lake City to pick up a 29, and uh, we got there and. We were test hopping this B-29. Well, you've got to take all these things into consideration. It's a high altitude city, so therefore the B-29 had to take off much more slowly. And the what what I sat there was a, a spotter on the side of the plane to make sure that everything was out, all right out my side. And we're starting to take off. We're starting to take off or in the air a few minutes. And all of a sudden, this brass ball goes flying by my window. And I said, you better get that goddamn antenna up. I said, there's guys playing golf down there. And there were. There were guys there playing golf down there. And this but he was coming down there like nobody's business. That was one of the rare experiences. Oh, I, I had some fascinating experiences, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh... So were you assigned to a B-29 to go to Japan or no, to be no, involved no, in it or no. just training? Just, just training. And, and testing the planes. Uh, when were you discharged? Okay, okay, the 13th of November, 45, all right. Do you remember uh, your, uh, when uh, President Roosevelt died, your reaction? Yes, I thought, my God, what's going to happen to this country? Mm -hmm. How did you feel about VE Day? Where were you when you heard about that? See, I really, 
I, I, that's a strange thing, I can't tell you. Okay. How did you feel when you heard about the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan? That horrified me. That really? horrified me. And that's why I give this Truman so much credit to, to take upon, and he, he was not involved in this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. He had no idea, like, no conception of anything, if any part of it, to make a decision like that. Mm -hmm. He was a fabulous man. And, and the top it all, in fact, they, they asked that very same question of me out at uh, Presley Chase for Matt. They have a newspaper, a Chase newspaper. Mm -hmm. They bring out once a month. And it's put out by the residents exclusively. And uh, some of the residents there interview other people. Mm -hmm. and that's what I said in that. And mm -hmm. the article, they, they asked me the same, president, the same question who mm -hmm. I thought was the best president we ever had. Mm -hmm. And my reaction was to follow up to Roosevelt. Because I can remember going down to the line to the B-29s and they said, uh, Pre President Roosevelt had died. And I thought, oh my God, what's going to happen mm -hmm. to this country? That was the only thought that went through my mind. Mm -hmm. Did you make use of the GI Bill at all when you left service? In what respect? Well, I don't know, housing, uh, to buy a home, to no. take further education? No, no, no I never took mm -hmm. any. Did you, were you aware of the 5220 Club? Did you use that at all? No. Okay. Did you join any veterans organizations? No. Mm -hmm. Still don't belong to any? Do you belong to the 8th Air Force? I, I belong to the 8th Air Force. They, they had a, a bomb group out in uh, California. It's pretty well disbanded now. Mm -hmm. It's a small thing to what it was before. Uh, I have a bunch of newspapers from there if you care to see them. Oh. They're, uh, they're the papers through the years where they're holding their meetings and they'd have mm -hmm. uh, items and some of the, some of the stuff you're hearing from me from other fellows, what they did. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think uh, your time in the service changed or affected your life? Oh, it made me feel so lucky in every respect. I, I today, I'm not supposed to be alive today. Mm -hmm. I was 85, uh, 84 years old last month. And I was a puny kid in the beginning. I've only weighed about, uh, I weigh about 142 now. And I, I, that's about the top weight. It give me maybe four pounds more or so. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I've been all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my parents didn't expect me to uh, live long enough to go to grammar school. Uh, the whole my whole life was like that. Mm -hmm. And I had a brother that was uh, about three or four inches taller than I was. And... Uh, he was a an athlete from the word go. In fact, he tried out for the New York Yankees. And the only thing was he was too old. And he was 21. He was too old at the time to try out. That's mm -hmm. what they told him. Mm -hmm. he, he was a phenomenal ball player. And his son, just see how this passes down. His son lives here. In fact, his father, his son is the one that told me to, about, to come up here. Uh, he lives in uh, Saratoga Springs now. But he is about five foot four. He's the most terrific athlete that I've ever known in my life. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he, he's not a big guy at all. And uh, he, he went to a Catholic high school. Now, I don't know whether you, you say, well, what difference does that make? Well, t let me tell you, Catholic high schools are a hell of a lot more combative than your public high schools. Mm -hmm. And he scored the, in Buffalo. He scored the winning touchdown against his arch rival, five foot four, on the last game of the season. Hmm. Even getting on the team was, was a, and then he ran he ran track and he made he had all kinds of records in track, and uh, they in the city of Buffalo they have they have about, I think maybe six or seven uh, Catholic high schools and they're all very tough as far as athletics mm -hmm. are concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had about oh, 10 or 12 years ago, they had a Hall of Fame, the High School Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. and he was admitted in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And they listed all his, his feats mm -hmm. in the course of his 
school, high school education. And he went on and uh, he wanted to uh, go to Cornell to play ball. He was going to get a scholarship. And my brother said to him, if you go at the University of Buffalo on them for their baseball team too. My father, my brother said to me, he said, if you go to the University of Buffalo, he said, I'll give you a, a new car when you graduate. You say, what's, what's this all about? Well, if he went to the University of Buffalo, he could live at home. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have to pay board or anything like yeah. that. And he did. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for your interview.